ready when you are, Tina. Thanks, Claire. Thanks for the invitation to come and chat to you guys this evening. And for those of you that are with us, thank you for putting us ahead of football, <laughs> as it's England Scotland that are playing. This evening, I want to talk to you about property sourcing compliance and keeping you on the right side of the law. Now, the presentation is what I call a mixed presentation. So there's stuff for investors who want to work with sources and also a lot of information for sourcing agents to keep you on track and compliant. But before we talk about that, a little bit about me. I promise you that the photo in the top right hand corner is of me. It uh, was taken in October uh, 1991 now. Flipping heck, that's a long time ago. I was a police officer for over 14 years, serving in the Lancashire Constabulary. Sadly, had to leave because I was quite seriously injured on duty. And so I had to find something else to do. Now, in 2005, Tony, my husband and I, we invested in property and we got it completely wrong. And the reason being was that back then, I'm not aware of any courses that were available. We had the idea that we wanted to invest in property. We wanted to have property that we could rent out to increase income, which was all fine and good. But we went about it completely the wrong way. And we worked with a national house builder and bought two properties from them off plan, thinking that we got a good deal because we got about 5% discount when actually we probably paid way over the mark for it. And to cap it all, there was a 12 month delay on build. And so any of you that are old enough to remember the crash of 2007, 2008, we were caught right in the middle of it. So the plan had been to buy, to hold for a couple of years, rent out and then flip on to make a profit because in our area during the previous 10 years or so huge gains have been made in the value of property in our area which is the Ribble Valley in Lancashire if any of you know it uh, but unfortunately that went pear-shaped and it didn't work out and so the two properties that we had we did rent one out but we ended up having to move into the other one which was a four-bedroom townhouse and we ended up staying there for 11 years in total. And just to uh, emphasize how much we didn't gain on it, even after 11 years, we only made 85,000 pounds profit on what we paid from it in comparison to what we actually sold it for. So we made every rookie mistake and to say that it hurt us financially, it did. And it kind of put us off investing in property, although we still love the property sector. Now I have nine years plus, approaching 10 years experience of deal sourcing and packaging, property sourcing, whatever you wanna call it. And I set up our company in January, 2012, and we incorporated in the October of that year. And we currently source specifically for investors, just purely a small number of investors that we source for, and we source in a way that we call sourcing to order. Now, for the first 12 months, I focused on the legality and the compliance side of the business. Um, from the image in top right hand corner, that should be no surprise to you. It was my first port of call was legislation and regulation. And I spent the first 10, 12 months researching it and networking to find investors that might be interested in working with me to invest in the North, um, where they may get a bit of return for their cash spent. Um, but I spent the first 12 months researching legality and compliance and realized that there was no central point to go to. No one was talking about it. And it was really quite well hidden. So now we work with investors directly for their sourcing needs. So we don't operate the way most sourcing agents do. We don't go and find a deal and then find a buyer. We actually bring the buyers on board that we want to work with after building a relationship up with them. They go through a registration and due diligence process with us. And at the end of that, we know pretty much exactly what it is that they're looking for and how they will assess it at the point when we forward information to them. And we only work with two or three at any given time. But I'm passionate about raising standards in the property sourcing sector. And I have been since I started researching it and realised that no one talked about the legality and the compliance around what we do. So back in, it's four years ago this year since I wrote my book and published it. <laughs> I can't believe that it's four years since that happened. 
and four and a half years since I started going out on what's known as the presentation circuit to speak to investors and sourcing agents to raise awareness and knowledge and increase education on the subject, which helps protect investors from unscrupulous sources. And hopefully by raising standards of sourcing agents, um, we raise standards in the sector across England, Wales and Scotland as well, to a certain extent. Um, because we are not thought highly of, shall we say, in the property investment sector. And I really, really want that to change. Now, since the debacle of 2005, Tony and I have invested again. We invested in a block of six flats. We bought, refurbished and flipped in 2017, 2018. So we jumped in with both feet on a commercial project, learned an awful lot. And yes, we did make some money. We haven't invested since because um, we've been getting our son through a seven year degree to become a vet. And before I leave the personal side of things, I can show you that I've got a bus bubbly from earlier. And the reason is that 10 o'clock this morning, our son David contacted us to let us know that he had passed his final exams and he is now a fully qualified veterinary surgeon. So he has finished his seven year degree and he is going to start work in September. Fantastic. So we've been celebrating with bubbly. And that is a more up-to-date image of me, although during COVID, my hair grew quite a bit, as you can see. So one of the first things that I want to talk to you about is, is property sourcing regulated? And the reason that I want to cover this is because it never ceases to amaze me how many times I see comments on social media and read them where people say, the problem with the sourcing sector is it isn't regulated. The problem is there is no rules around it. The problem is this, the problem is that. Well, the problem isn't that it isn't regulated because it has been since at least 1979 when the Estate Agents Act 1979 came out. And the Estate Agents Act 1979 in section one gives us the definition of an estate agent or estate agency work. Now, let's be clear, an estate agent isn't necessarily just those on the high street. Estate agency work is anything that is defined as this. So estate agency work includes introducing and or negotiating. And those, that is a real key sentence if you think about it. Introducing and or negotiating with people who want to buy or sell freehold or leasehold property and the Scottish equivalent including commercial and agricultural, and where this is done in the course of business and pursuant or under instructions from a client. So can you see how that description, that definition absolutely fits what sourcing agents do? We introduce and or negotiate with people who want to buy or sell in the pursuance of business, because most of us want to get paid for doing it, and under instructions of a client, whether that is the buyer or whether that is the seller. So we are regulated. And because we fit this definition, we are regulated by everything that regulates your common or garden high street estate agent. Now, what I want to go through now are my top tips for the three main pieces of regulation and legislation. Now there are about 15 pieces of legislation and regulation that actually govern the sector. But I wanna give you three top tips for the three main pieces. And the first one, we go back to the Estate Agents Act 1979 that we just talked about. And this piece of legislation made it clear that you had to handle client money professionally. Now, one of the key issues that we have in the sourcing sector at the moment is that a lot of sourcing agents absolutely do not handle client money professionally. One of the main complaints that I hear about is investors handing over sums of money up front and then never seeing the money again for dust. The source disappears and no deals come to light. It was stated even back then that you had to join an officially recognized estate agent's redress scheme. So even back in 1979, we had to join a redress scheme. It also states that you should not mislead, lie or withhold relevant information. Now on that point, it goes on to say that you should not withhold information or lie or mislead about anything that would even lead your potential buyer 
to not view the property. That is how in depth this piece of legislation goes. So if you lie to get your investor to go and view the property, knowing if they knew a piece of information, they wouldn't view it. Technically, you're in breach of the Estate Agent Act. Data Protection Regulations 2018, most people still refer to GDPR. Actually, GDPR are the European regulations. And when we left Europe in 2018, we adopted basically the GDPR regulations into UK law as the Data Protection Regulations 2018. And what they state is that you have to have a good understanding as to what data you collect, how you collect it, how you hold it, how you dispose of it have a data privacy policy in place. This is a legal requirement. Reassess your data privacy policy at least annually. And the third piece of legislation that I wanna to talk to you about are the money laundering regulations. And what they state are, you must have an anti-money laundering policy in place. It is a legal requirement. You must have a client risk assessment in place you must have a written client procedure in place and electronic due diligence, trust me, is required. You could say it's optional, but for me, you cannot carry out full due diligence on your clients where you need to go and do it without using a good electronic due diligence system. Now also for data protection and money laundering, it is required that you have at least annual training in each topic. And as far as money laundering regulations are concerned, which are controlled by HMRC, every person, if you're a limited company that is a director or a shareholder, must have proof of training, even if they are not frontline business. And I know that because we got fined £80 because our son is a director of our company, not a shareholder. He works in the background on social media, never goes near any of our clients, has no idea really what we do as a company on the front line. But we were fine because one, we didn't declare him to HMRC as having become a director and two, we didn't have proof of training for him. So for the Queen of Compliance, I'm confessing that we were actually fined £80 by HMRC. So learn from our mistakes. Wow. Now, a lot of deal packaging courses, training courses talk to you about the things that you need to be compliant. And they'll mention insurance, professional indemnity insurance. They will mention registering with the Ombudsman. They'll mention registering for data protection supervision. They'll mention registering with HMRC for money laundering supervision. But what they don't tell you is what sits underneath. Those registrations and insurance are the iceberg that you can see at the top here, the tiny bit at the top. But the bit that's really dangerous, the bit that no one talks about is the bit that sits underneath here. And it's the bit that sits underneath that you guys who are sourcing really, really need to understand or you are seriously breaching regulations. So you are required to join one of two property ombudsmen. And the two that are, I should change that to property redress schemes rather than property ombudsman. I'll explain in a moment what I've been finding out over the last couple of months about what I believe were two property ombudsmen earlier this year. So you must register with one. The, uh, the first one is the Property Ombudsman or TPO. The second is Property Redress Scheme or PRS. Now, I'd always believed and assumed because of the research that I'd done and chatting with National Trading Standards that because they were both approved that they both sang from the same hymn sheet. No, they don't. And I recently found out from chatting with the head of legals for the Ombudsman who I work with on other projects anyway, that the property ombudsman actually are an ombudsman, which is completely different to a redress scheme. So they are an ombudsman and they register with the Ombudsman Association. They're also a property redress scheme underneath it. But property redress scheme are just a redress scheme. So all they do are deal with complaints. So what's the difference between the two? The ombudsman receive on average about 40,000 queries a year. Only about 5,000 of those last year went through to full complaint. But the others, because they're an ombudsman, can be guided, given advice, signposted, all sorts of other different support can be provided. From what I can gather, the property redress scheme literally just deal with complaints. 
But here's the rub, and this is important for not just for sourcing agents, but also for you investors that are working with a sourcing agent or even a lettings agent or a management company that are managing and are registered with PRS for the redress scheme. The property redress scheme are consumer led, which means consumers are individuals and not businesses. Now, the TPO have a statement in their terms of use that they will deal with complaints from anyone, business, charity, trust, individual consumer makes no difference as long as their provable turnover is less than three million pounds. The problem that I have at the moment with the PRS is this. They are consumer led. They don't have a code of practice. They base their um, due diligence. They base their understanding of complaints around consumer protection regulations or CPRs. Now, what they have said is this. On initial complaint, they will treat any complainant, i.e. you as an investor, if you're working with a sourcer or with a lettings agent or a management agent as a consumer for their initial um, assessment of the case. Should they decide that you are not a consumer or a business, then the complaint any longer, they will hand it back and say, I'm sorry, we can't deal with it. The problem that we have is they will not define from their perspective as to where a consumer turns into a business. So I can't help you if you are an investor as to where you sit, whether you will be considered to be a consumer or whether you will be considered to be a business. So as a sourcing agent, I strongly suggest the reason that you're joining one of the property redress schemes is because they are supposed to give that independent body that if something goes wrong, they will review independently a complaint. If the one that you're registered with won't hear the complaints of the people that are your clients because they're considered to be businesses, what's the point in paying the registration fee for it? And at this moment in time, I cannot get more clarity than what I have just given you. So guys, you're gonna to have to make a judgment call as to who you register with. And investors, if you're working with management teams, lettings agents, you might wanna contact them and get them to tell, ask, ask the PRS exactly what the demarcation line is for consumer to business, because I can't get it out of them. So that is property ombudsman, property redress scheme. I should re-change that too, actually. You must register for data protection supervision, and that is done with the Information Commissioner's Office. You must register for anti-money laundering supervision, and that is done with HMRC. Now, all of those put together with some insurance that you have to have in year one will cost you in the region of £1,100 as sourcing agents. So it is not a zero cost entry section. And this does not include any training on either how to deal package or how to do it legally or any of the documentation legally that you have to have in place. So there is a cost to setting up your business, which quite often is skimmed over by certain areas of training section for um, not just property sourcing, but the property investment segment in general. So the registrations and your insurance are literally the tip of the iceberg of full compliance. If you are registered and you don't understand what you're registered for, this iceberg is waiting to come and tear you apart. Penalties. Failure to register for either a redress scheme, Information Commissioner's Office or HMRC will cost you up to £5,000 for each of them every time you're caught. And under any, under any of the regulations that were governed, maximum penalties are unlimited fine up to 14 years in prison. And that is, believe it or not, anti money laundering regulations. Now, I want to go through with you seven questions that all of you investors should ask a sourcer before working with them. And the first one is, what is your company structure? And the reason that this is important is because it sets the seal as to where you can go and due diligence or research on a prospective sourcer. If they're a limited company, you can go to company's house. If they're not, you're restricted to social media. But I strongly suggest that you search in a lot of avenues and make sure <clears throat> that what is being said is consistent, that they're consistent across all their messaging, and that because they're operating as a business, really, 
They should have a business page at least, probably on Facebook and LinkedIn, not all of them do. But I would suggest that if you're running a business, the business page is really key. If you can't set up a website, I, I get that. Don't set up the website, run a business page and put the business contact details on there. But at least have a contact page that people can go to that outlines how you work as a sourcing agent. So that an investor looking into thinking about working with you can actually get a lot of information that they need to make that decision as to whether they are going to work with you or not. So what is your company structure? Does your sourcer have insurance? Now, legally, they should have at least £100,000 professional indemnity insurance. And if they join the TPO, the property ombudsman, they have to prove that they have got it by providing the certificate to prove that they have the insurance upon application. If they join PRS, they just have to tick a box to say that they've got it. They don't have to send in proof. And I can tell you now that an awful lot of sourcing agents join PRS, one, because it's cheaper to do it, and two, because you don't have to prove you've got insurance. And some unscrupulous people are telling people who don't bother with insurance if you can't afford it, do a couple of deals and then get some after. But if anything goes wrong and you're losing a lot of money on a deal, you need to know that that person that you're working with, that professional, which is what a sourcing agent should be, has that insurance in place just in case anything goes wrong. Because let's face it, sources come into the sector, not because they're rich and they love sourcing, they come into the sector because they're cash poor and they want to build a cash pot to go on and invest. And so they're using your cash invariably to cash flow their business. So please, please ensure that they've got appropriate insurance in place. Are they registered for a property redress scheme? Are they registered with the property ombudsman or PRS? And I talked to you about the risks of making the choice as to whether it's a TPO or the PRS. I can't give you a definitive response as to who the PRS will cover because I don't honestly know. They will not give us clarity. And even people who are members and are querying will not be, are not being given clarity at this moment in time. Maybe we'll get it eventually, but at this moment in time, there isn't any. Are they registered for data protection supervision? Why is that so important? It's really important because if a sorcerer is as professional as they should be in doing the, the job that they should be, they have to ask you as the investor for a lot of personal information. Copies of a driving license, passport, bank statements, audit trail of where your cash has come from, all sorts of different information that they are going to hold on you. Where are they gonna put that information? I can tell you now that they hold enough information on you if they're doing it properly, that if that data is stolen by an unscrupulous person, your identity can easily be cloned and that unscrupulous person set up credit cards, take loans, take other debt on in your name and cause you no end of heartache for a long period of time. So please, please, as an investor, ensure that your sourcing agent understands the principles of data protection and ask them what information they're going to want to gather and where are they going to be keeping it and what is the security on that location and I can tell you now that Google Drive isn't particularly secure neither is OneDrive or any of the others and certainly not holding an emails as attachments. Are they registered for anti-money laundering supervision? They do that with HMRC. Now, why as an investor would you be at all bothered as to whether they're registered for money laundering supervision and whether they ask you where your cash has come from, if they're bothered or not? Surely it doesn't matter to you. You just want to know that the deal fits your criteria and then you can buy it. You don't give a damn if they ask you any questions about where that cash has come from. Well, you might do if it goes wrong on the other side because money can be loaded on the sale equally as well as it can be on the purchase. And if the sourcing agent doesn't understand what questions to ask you as the investor, they're not gonna understand what questions to ask the seller, which they're legally required to do. And if that seller is laundering money through the property that's sold and you buy it, you could be sucked into a national crime agency investigation if they perceive that some naughty activity has been going on. And I'm sure that none of you want that. So please ensure that your sourcing agent understands money laundering and understands what they should be asking the seller about the reasons for it coming up to sale. And I can tell you now 
that two of the red flags that HMRC are really keen on, right at this moment in time, they've updated their list, are the terms BMV and cash purchase. And those are the two terms that most sourcing agents love dearly, probably more than anything else on planet Earth. And they are two of the big red flags that HMRC believe potentially lead to money laundering offences. Do they have professional documentation in place? The amount of times that I get complaints from investors who have been royally fleeced by sources and they say they promised this, they promised that, they promised the other, I gave them all of this money and now nothing has come of it, what can I do? And my first question usually is, what was the agreement that you signed with them? Did they have a terms of business agreement? Was it called something else? Some contract that you signed as an agreement? And the majority of people that say, I just signed an NDA to get the information is unbelievable. Because I can tell you now, even if they're a member of a property redress scheme, and you can take your complaint to that redress scheme, if there is no professional contract in place, it's very difficult to prove that they haven't fulfilled any promises that they made especially if they were verbal and you have no proof of it. So please ensure that they have professional documentation in place. And last but not least, do they have an in-house complaints procedure in place? This is a requirement of membership of the Ombudsman. And the reason that this is a very important requirement is because the Ombudsman, the redress schemes, neither of them will deal with your complaint if you have not gone through through the sources in-house complaints procedure to start off with. And that potentially is an eight week period that that sourcing agent has to be able to deal with the complaint. Now they're easy to get hold of because they can pick up a free one off my Facebook group, which is ours. Or um, I think both ombudsmen have freebies that you can actually download. But if your sourcer does not have an in-house complaints procedure, and I'll tell you the vast majority don't, and you can't go through their procedure, it delays you in being able to go to the ombudsman because you can't prove that you've gone through the in-house complaints procedure process. I wanna share with you some interesting facts and figures. In 2017-18, HMRC issued 535 individual penalties just exceeding 2.7 million pounds in fines, not because people were money laundering, but because people breached what are known as minimum standards. This year alone, HMRC have issued in excess of 23 million pounds worth of fines so far. Somebody at HMRC had a light bulb moment, guys. They realized they didn't have to go and do doorstep checks. They didn't have to come out to you and your business they can send out emails and letters, tell you what it is that they're looking for, the information that they want and give you 10 days to produce it or else. The National Crime Agency, they've just updated the report actually, I was reading through it um, the other day, estimate that hundreds of billions of pounds now, not just 100 billion, but hundreds of billions of pounds are laundered through the UK alone every year. Now, a recent um, suspicious activity report update. Now, suspicious activity reports are supposed to be submitted by those who are governed by, supervised by HMRC for money laundering purposes, including sourcing agents. And if we work with someone and we believe they're up to dodgy dealing, we are supposed to submit a SAR or a, a suspicious activity report to the National Crime Agency. During this period of time, and it hasn't increased much recently, I can tell you that, of all of the reports that were submitted, those from the estate agency sector, of which sourcing agents are a part, submitted 0.13%. And a recent survey of estate agency businesses stated they firmly believe that 66% of estate agency businesses are not compliant with anti-money laundering regulations. I can tell you in the sourcing sector, I I think fully compliant sourcing agents who understand exactly what they're doing are in the 1% in the UK. And I can tell you now that if you search LinkedIn, for the term deal packager, property source, uh, all of the variations that you can find, there are 36,000 plus registered in the UK alone as being sourcing agents or a type of sourcing agent in the UK at this moment of time.
So what's the importance of compliance for a sourcing agent? It provides you with that professional foundation for your business. And for me, before you can grow your business, you have to have that professional foundation. You are not going to get to where you want to be. And most people coming into the sector want to leave the full-time job and run a sourcing business full-time. And most of them, when they answer my questions before they get a free call with me, will say within 12 months, I want to be on the 30K salary from my sourcing business and have left my full-time job. The chances of that are pretty slim, I have to say. Uh, bringing everybody back down to earth with a bump. But what you need is that professional foundation for your business and then you can build on it. It shows proof that you are providing a high standard of service. It shows that you have put some skin in the game. You're wanting your investor to do the same and pay you some money up front. Most sourcing agents do. Let's have it where we actually put our money where our mouth is and we actually put some skin in the game and we actually set up compliantly from the word go. So it shows that we have a high standard of service. It helps prevent serious crimes such as money laundering and tax evasion. And trust me when I say that HMRC, HMRC are all over our sector like a rash at this moment in time. And the average fine issued by HMRC, not for money laundering, but because you don't understand about client due diligence, about timing of verification, about record keeping, about staff training, about all sorts of different things like having policies in place and procedures in place and risk assessments in place. You're in breach of the regulations and the average fine at the moment is just over 7,000 pounds. And bear in mind that all they have to do is email you or send you a letter and give you 10 days to prove that you are compliant. Not just that you've got the documentation in place, but they ask you what clients you've worked with over the last 12 months, what projects you've done, and they wanna see the due diligence that you've done on those clients and the risk assessments that you've completed on those clients. It provides your investors with a professional quality and legal service and that peace of mind that you actually might know what you're doing legally, you might actually be providing a professional service. And if something does go wrong, and it sometimes does, that there is that safety net in place of the insurance, of the property redress scheme, and you having an in-house complaints procedure, you understand how it works, you deal with your investors professionally, that peace of mind that it gives your investors, and then you get the best quality investors for you to actually work with. Now, now, just before I go on to the contact page, I just want to talk to you about one other thing, and that is a new national association which will be being launched in the UK, fingers crossed, next month, she says. And that new national association is called the National Association of Professional Sourcing Agents, or NAPSA for short. It has been a dream of mine for six or seven years now. I've been working on it for the last four years, the last three of which with the property ombudsman linked in with national trading standards. And fingers crossed, we will be launching next uh, month. What does that mean for sourcing agents? It means for the first time in the UK, you can join a professional association for a moderate cost. You will, before being accepted as a member, have to prove the highest level of compliance of anywhere in the UK that you have to join and we do check it manually, administratively check full compliance. You will have to provide copies and proof of documentation that legally you should have in place. But the great benefit of that is that when you've proved it and you are compliant and you're accepted, you are then searchable as a sourcing agent on our site free of charge free of charge by any investor that wants to use a site for searches. And as an investor, you can search geographically. So you can search Northwest or you can search town, whichever you want. And you can search the strategy, the investment strategy that you're interested in from commercial conversions to land, to buy, to let, to flips, whatever it is that you want. When you fill in those details, it will bring you up a list of sourcing agents that are members who fulfill that criteria and hopefully from the end of September going forward, you will be able to click on any of those sourcing agents. It will open up their profile page and it will show you key details such as the ombudsman that they're registered with, the date that their membership expires, who they have insurance with, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. 
the sourcing agent will have to have a contract that the investor will have to sign and that will be visible for you to be able to view prior to you even contacting the sourcing agent and declaring that you're interested in working with them. So there will be huge benefits on both sides for both the sourcing agent to be found by really keen investors in one spot and prove that you have a high quality of professional um, set up in the industry and as far as investors are concerned free of charge you will have a go-to spot to be able to search for sourcing agents and see all of the level of compliance which you will know has been manually checked by us and we will be doing monthly random checks to continue that sourcing agents to continue to meet the same high quality and are still registered with the ombudsman data protection and money laundering and these bodies are willing to share their information as we are willing to share information with them as a national association um, so that's a little bit about NAPSA that is fingers crossed launching next month that is the end of my presentation guys I hope you've enjoyed it there are some brief contact details there but for now over to Claire and thank you very much for listening Thank you, Tina. That was brilliant. Thank you so much. Lots of great content. Con I can't even talk now. Content in there.